Okay, uh, maybe I'll start and perhaps uh, other people will join along the way. Uh, so, hello and welcome to the first uh, meeting of the Digital Europe Economic Seminars. It's really nice to see you here. Um, before, uh, before we start, I would like to take this opportunity to, opportunity to just say a few words. So this is our first meeting. Let me just... Uh, share a very short presentation. Um, so uh, Digital Europe Economic Seminars uh, is a series that we are starting and that's aimed at hosting uh, scholars from the EU who study the topics of digitalization. As, and we're going to have two meetings uh, each month and uh, on a broad range of topics hopefully this will create a sort of a platform so that first we can learn and second to meet people who um, deal with uh, topics that we might also be interested in and thus facilitating perhaps some future um, joint work or collaboration or at the very least so that we all know who to uh, contact uh, or or invite if we're interested in a, any specific topic. And this is an initiative that is uh, conducted as part of the uh, program excellence initiative at Research University at the University of Warsaw and managed by the Digital Economy Lab, uh, which is this interdisciplinary team uh, uh, at the University of Warsaw. Uh, dealing with uh, different areas of digitalization. And if you register, there's a link to a Google calendar or just a regular calendar that you can add to your, uh, to your calendars to keep track of, of, the, of the meetings. And that's one thing I wanted to say. And the second, uh, very briefly, um, we're the today's meeting is going to relate also to the cultural economics and as it happens we just launched the association for cultural economics poland at the university of warsaw and we are very happy happy to have the blessing of the association for cultural economics international uh, and this is something that aims to gather scholars of cultural economics in poland and hopefully in the region uh, for the first time to allow for easier cooperation and sharing uh, of studies. Uh, for now, the, at the inception, it gathers people from different areas of economics at uh, the Faculty of Economic Sciences of the University of Warsaw. There's quite a few of us already. Uh, many of us, uh, like, uh, daily deal with other topics related to economics, but are also interested uh, in culture and would like to apply what their uh, regular expertise to topics re related to culture. And right now we're working on launching a website, which will hopefully uh, happen soon. And we would like to invite cultural economists from Poland and the region to join. Uh, in the future, we are also going to probably or some uh, workshops, conferences, and joint research. And we're also planning to uh, launch a Students Associ Association of Cultural and Digital, Digital Entertainment Economics, uh, which will hopefully also create a room for new uh, scholars uh, on cultural economics to emerge. And this uh, Students Association is also going to be a part of this excellence initiative framework with the DLAP UW as a, as a sort of uh, support and the ones who manage this uh, part of the framework. Okay, and that would be all from me. Thank you very much. And I would now like to pass the floor to Christian uh, of the Erasmus University Rotterdam. And Christian is also uh, member of the board at the Association for Cultural Economics International. So I'm very happy uh, for him to, to be here uh, for this first seminar. And yeah, and I think, yes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much.
Okay, a uh, typical moment of awkwardness. Uh, my file has been moved. Um, Wojciech, have you stopped screen sharing successfully? Yes. yes. Wonderful. And I'm hunting for my file. There we go. It's the very last one. And here we are. Thanks for your patience. So, uh, thanks very much. Um, congratulations, first of all, to Wojciech and his colleagues, Viktor, Nikolai Bartosz, Anna, Alexandra, and on the entire list because it wasn't on the screen for long enough. I'm very sorry, but I'm very excited that we have an uh, Association for Cultural Economics Poland. Um, I wish we had one in Germany. Um, and um, well, I come from Erasmus University, Rotterdam. That together with University of Amsterdam um, would probably make up most of the Cultural Economics Association of Cultural Economics Netherlands. Um, so maybe there's not much point in setting things up there because it seems to be quite concentrated. Also because it's a country that's not uh, particularly large. Um, I have um, um, had some exciting interactions with some, with Wojciech and several of his colleagues uh, of late. So I'm really uh, honored and pleased that I can uh, support this initiative, uh, both the um, the series of seminars on digitalization as well as the uh, Association for Cultural Economics Poland. So um, that being said, my presentation will have two parts. I will give a primer on cultural economics. Obviously, I think I know what cultural economics is, even though that doesn't necessarily find universal agreements with my colleagues, but we'll get there in a minute. And then I will talk about something that a very ambitious attempt to bring uh, many of the insights together and um, produce lots of relevant um, empirical data in order to solve some of the pervasive issues that at least from an economic perspective we keep finding in the cultural sector, Na namely that it's absolutely rife with market failure. And it's not even clear anymore what the underlying market failure is because it seems to be everything, all the archetypal um, uh, ideal worlds, um, uh, conditions for perfectly functioning markets uh, that economists tend to uh, warm themselves at and uh, maybe sometimes even aim for um, um, are very hard to even uh, to fathom how they could possibly be, be um, approximated. Um, and so that makes it an exciting challenge. Okay, uh, that being said, first of all, I um, ne also need to um, uh, give some credit. And um, this, what I'm presenting here, is um, based on joint work with over several publications and, and over the years with lots of colleagues. We've got the list here. Um, and uh, since it's not complete, I'm not going to read out the names, but it should be clear that this is, you know, I'm presenting more or less on behalf of several teams even even though all mistakes are certainly mine. That being said, let's go right to a primer on cultural economics. And we could even start having a debate whether the Journal of Cultural Economics is actually the heart of the whole affair. It's certainly a reasonably well-reputed uh, economics journal these days. It's certainly on the up with increasing impact factors and so on. Um, but it's also interesting to see that the most cited work from the Journal of Cultural Economics tends to be not actually quite eco uh, all that economic in terms of uh, methods. Um, um, uh, sociological work or work that is um, genuinely inter or transdisciplinary gets a lot more attention than the econometric work or maybe even the formal modeling that some people have uh, have come up with, whatever that says about writing strategy and impacts and so on. Now, um, in any case, um, I've got good news for anybody here who's interested in cultural economics, and some of you might very well be, and that is, first of all, that it's a growing field. Um, I, a while ago, um, I started working on a bibliometric overview of cultural economics, here are some preliminary results, obviously in need of, of some updates, but the trends are reasonably clear. Since um, the uh, around the year 1999-2000, uh, we have an increasing share of art, journal articles in business and economics that are dealing with arts and culture. And this was established based on a research of metadata on Web of Science. 
so it's the high up, it's the high end, so to speak, of academic publications, journal articles in long-standing peer-reviewed academic journals. And if you want to hear uh, something about the distribution, uh, some areas are actually quite under-researched. Some work, um, lo lots of work has been done on audiovisual entertainment, particularly movies and television series and so on. World Check might be a case in point. Some other colleagues here too. Video games have received lots of attention. The traditional, the, the, the starting point of cultural economics in a narrow sense, performing arts, visual arts, um, and book publishing have are not that greatly researched. And now today we'll be talking about the music industry that I used to think that that was like the most researched part, but it certainly isn't anymore. Movies has received lots of attention of late. So why do we do cultural economics? Now, amongst cultural economics, there are two camps. First of all, some say that they want to improve cultural policy and decision making in the culture sector, harnessing economic theory and methods. And there's lots of people uh, like that. And then secondly, many people want to improve economics by discussing black swans territories. There are even people who take an interest in trying and testing, or maybe should I say falsifying cultural as a economic theory and methods because their, their expectation, the very expectation is that economics falls flat when it tries to investigate this part of the world. And uh, it's in any case, it's an exciting topic. What is clear is that the second part has worked. Baumol's cost disease is, is in the arsenal of mainstream microeconomists around the globe. Baumol's cost disease, um, which suggests that due to the labor intensity of the performing arts, especially the traditional performing arts like opera and um, the classical music performances, their relative costs in comparison to more technology intensive industries will uh, continuously increase the relative costs and therefore they will be either slowly but surely fading out, make up a small, smaller share of, um, of overall economic activity or need prepping up an increasing amount of public support. Now, this idea, this hypothesis has been around for, uh, has been around for a long time and has become mainstream discussion and mainstream discussion point amongst uh, microeconomists and sometimes even macroeconomists. To be sure, it isn't necessarily true because of course, with rising living standards, we know that many arts are luxury goods. So there may be many compensating factors and the story isn't quite as simple as that. Perhaps more up to date, when you look at the theory of two-sided or multi-sided markets that so many people are so excited about these days, even Jean Tyrol, when he introduced the very theory, half of the examples came from the cultural industries. A very obvious case in point being video game consoles. Online music services are another, another case in point. So uh, here, economists do not only talk about credit cards um, and the difference between a mall and a retail, a normal retail store and so on. They generally engage uh, with, the, uh, with the cultural sector. And there's been some, well, lessons learned about how to improve economics um, in the cultural sector. So both of these things are certainly valid. Regarding the first point, improving cultural policy, um, it's always really inspiring and the sparks fry, uh, fly when uh, economists meet either lawyers in terms of copyright policy or when they meet um, experts on cultural policy from other disciplines or even practitioners. And let's see whether this today is a case in point, which gets me to an important point I wanna make, still relatively early in my presentation, I would very much appreciate it if you would interrupt me whenever you have a question. To my understanding, Wojciech will correct me if I'm wrong or will step in as a moderator, but I think we have enough time for that. And I'd much rather get signals from the audience what excites you or what you want to challenge and have a discussion here or there, maybe several times over this presentation than just, you know, have an uninterrupted ride. I know it can be tedious just to listen for a long time. So please, if anybody has any question or follow up, or extension to make anytime, please.
and I can't see you, so waving won't work. You actually have to say something and interrupt me, yeah? And it's going to be welcome. Okay, I'm still a little bit of loose territory. This is kind of the loosest territory I'm going to dare to present today, which is like a very fundamental, a, a mind map, very provisional mind map of uh, fundamental and exciting challenges that people investigating, maybe social scientists more generally, but certainly economists, keep encountering and re-encountering when they engage with the cultural sector. There are, you know, uh, concerns or there's the issue of what incentivizes creativity, which is not that obvious. And certainly models that overemphasize pecuniary rewards do not seem to work particularly well. You have uh, the social construction of value that many people have become really excited about, how art, uh, the valuation of artworks, for instance, can hardly be explained with the inherent characteristics of the artwork in and of themselves, but often seems to become to come about in a very complex uh, social process. Sociologists might be at least as qualified, maybe more qualified than many economists, but some cultural economists try to find a good uh, connection uh, between these two uh, issues. Market value in uh, gen the market value of many cultural products seems to be much smaller than the total social value. Um, there are issues of conspicuous consumption and social dis distinction that seem to be very important uh, to explain demand side phenomena uh, in the cultural sector, why people engage with culture, why they're willing to pay, why they're willing to pay for top end works made that are very well known to many other people as well much more than seems to be necessary to decorate your living room. <coughs> and a very broad issue is the apparent supposed tension between art and commerce. I myself think that this is often exaggerated and um, um, often even lazy thinking to just say that uh, commerce and art yeah, are incommensurable. I would say to the contrary, um, um, if we design um, transactions reasonably well, and I'm deliberately not saying markets in a very narrow sense, but if we design the way we interact with each other um, around and with um, uh, regarding culture and cultural works, um, I think there's much to gain. And that's really one of the ambitions I have in my as an individual in my career. And fi finally, you have the value generated by users, the value generated by users and use for others and technological change. And here, prime examples are certainly, I mentioned multi and two-sided markets already, the fact that uh, these days it's become almost unmissable that as we engage with cultural works online, we leave valuable information that is harnessed and um, um, used as an input to generate further services for all kinds of other users, recommendation systems, for instance, or just to inform a firm strategy, production strategy, and so on. We might even leave our own reviews online. And that the very active role and the value generating role of what we used to think of, at least in econom economics, as relatively passive users, is become very important. And that goes beyond the active role of deciphering and engaging and making sense of cultural works. It's actually that we generate work uh, value for others. I reckon that has always been the case, actually, but uh, digital, uh, digital markets and the enormous value of big data based um, enterprises really drove that message home. And I'm very excited about that. So away from the loose mind mapping kind of uh, story to the theoretical aspects or some more of theoretical aspects of cultural economics. So here I'm using jargon quite deliberately to make sure I get, you know, I make the connections. First of all, uh, you have intrinsic motivation to create and non-pecuniary returns. And this is by far, I mean, th that there is some intrinsic motivation uh, and some non-pecuniary returns of creative work, at least, or maybe other types of engaging with culture um, is borne out by a really, really strong and diverse range of empirical evidence these days. Why exactly people seem to be mm, relatively insensitive to pecuniary aspects only and seem to have a strong preference for creative work is not that easy to say. And um, that's why I say intrinsic motivation and non-pecuniary returns, which are not the same thing. 
Um, but there's something going on that goes way, way beyond money. And even the most hard-nosed economists um, have come to that conclusion, you know, when they thought about arts and culture. We certainly have highly differentiated products and oversupply. So um, that might be a result of intrinsic motivation. And see this cross connection already leads me to this little gray box down here that there's no clear logical sequence uh, as various of these list items interrelate with each other. If you know how to put this into a perfect logical sequence where there's no, you know, getting back to prior points and they're really mutually exclusive, I'd love to see that. I haven't. Um, so, you know, this is um, not the most definitive of lists, but um, I don't think there's any better in the published literature. At least I'm not aware of it, and I'd certainly like a cue if you find one. So um, we have intrinsic motivation that might explain how there is, um, there are is in really literally hundreds of thousands of new songs, uh, tens of thousands of video games, uh, thousands and thousands of movies being released each year, many more than any individual not only could consume in full, that's out of the question, but um, it's, almost, it's also virtually impossible to do reasonably comprehensive product searches. Even if I said I only care about, um, I only care about science fiction movies, I would probably not make a complete, get a complete overview of what's available to me before I start watching. Um, we certainly have relatively low barriers to entry because there's no definite investment you need to incur in order to, you know, release a movie or release a, a, certainly a book or a song in contrast to pharmaceuticals or whatever, right, or cars. And what needs to be clear is that we have non-deteriorating goods, um, non-deteriorating in the physical sense that once something is online or on a CD, uh, it deteriorates very slowly or virtually not at all. Uh, that doesn't mean that the value of the work itself is stable with consumption, but that comes later. We have experienced good attributes and creative uh, of creative works, which is just you know putting this into uh, terms of Nelson, 1970, a very famous article in microeconomics that people take decisions, users take decisions based on incomplete information. And uh, you have demand uncertainty on the supplier side, which is very similar to suppliers of any kind of innovative product, really, in a reasonably, in a market with monopolistic competition, certainly. But uh, that that um, it's very hard to predict what works will sell uh, is the, the, the cultural sector is notorious for that. You have differentiated preferences and taste for variety amongst users. And the most, um, the most attractive uh, explanations that I find are either novelty seeking that we all probably share the experience when we read a thriller book, we probably won't read it a second time around. When we watch a movie, there's very few movies we watch several times in a row. We tend to move from quite similar movies to the next movie that might be quite similar. I actually have a, a colleague working on that right now. Um, whether that actually is how, how, how similar the movies that people watch in sequence actually are. Well, what it's clear is that people um, change their preferences either because they, they appreciate novelty and surprise in cultural works or because their tastes change with consumption. And there might be scope for a little bit of both. We have social interdependent demand formation, which might explain the observation of fans and fashion, superstar effects, and social distinction that seems to be important uh, in explaining much of cultural consumption, certainly in the high-end art market, for instance. We have diverse values of creative works and crowding effects that people seem to not only care about markets, uh, uh, value, pecuniary values and returns seems to be an element of, of cultural value and social value and the the way that these values can be transferred into each other is um is a very challenging question that some of my colleagues at Erasmus university have been working on for a long time and we have the, then finally public good attributes of creative works because they're non-rival in consumption once a work is uploaded my slides here for instance once they're uploaded online any of you can use them reuse them as you see, as you please, regardless of how many others might uh, might look at them at the same time or a copy of them at the same time. Um, but I mentioned already that uh, this non-rivalry and consumption um, does not mean that 
the the value is not is is the, the use value is actually non deteriorating individually as you use it and what needs to be very clear technically speaking public goods um, and cultural works might be well classified as public goods but exclude having the exclusive right to market them either because you're the copyright holder or and there's effective copyright protection or because you are a platform that has an exclusive license like Disney Plus on many Disney um, um, works or Amazon, I'm, um, I'm still renting DVDs sometimes. I go to an art house DVD rental store and uh, they increasingly tell me that the new, um, the new television series produced by Amazon, for instance, I certainly know about Amazon, I'm not sure about Netflix, are not released on DVD anymore, not even with a delay, right? And so keeping this exclusive, um, it might actually be very valuable, right? So technically you can serve as many customers as you wish um marginal costs are very low and so um, you can serve great great numbers of people but you might still try to aim for exclu uh, exclusivity and then we have the hairy issue which will be very much in focus today in my presentation and later part in the second part is the non-excludability of works that it's hard to establish and enforce non -ex um, um exclusive rights to these works, especially once they're disseminated, at least in part, online. And of course, lo and behold, technological change are very exciting. Blockchain technology um, supposedly is about to change that. Non-fungible tokens and so on is like the, the latest rave. And now all of a sudden, uh, digital rights management looks like it might actually work, might actually be efficient, and might actually be cool which I still don't think, uh, well, I mean, I haven't quite make the, uh, I haven't quite bought into the idea, but that's certainly my perception of the popular debate that I get to see in the, uh, in the press. And then finally, we have cost structures um, of high sunk costs of creation and relatively low marginal costs. When I say high sunk costs of creation, I don't mean high as in creating a new pharmaceutical treatment for a major disease, but high in comparison to the virtually zero marginal cost once a work is created and can be disseminated online, for instance. Okay, any questions so far? And let's move on from the, well, what we might consider a positive analysis or, you know, trying to relate what we think we know about the cultural sector to economic theory and talk about how we make, you know, structure debates on normative assessments or wh how what policy should look like or how do we know that a policy worked well or not and so on. And there are the basic messages that welfare economics, when we look at welfare economics and market failure, you could basically just, when any cultural industry I'm aware of, you could end up leaning back and saying virtually any market failure is probably is probably apparent whether we can simultaneously address them all of them in one big glob um is in, is another question sometimes it's just too tedious and we don't have the time but um they're virtually all there um i have a slightly abbreviated version of the standard list here uh, so in any case there's a plethora of market failures in the culture sector we have first of all the pervasive issue of incomplete information we have thus and this is an important point to make that transaction costs, in my understanding, are the result of incomplete information. And high transaction costs, as we know, lead to market failure and maybe even missing markets. You have quality uncertainty, you have asymmetric information. Famous authors such as Richard Caves have claimed it's not really asymmetric information. Sometimes often it's mutual ignorance that nobody knows. Uh, but I think there's still great issues with asymmetric information um, quite a bit. Um, and secondly, we have uh, market power. We have economies of scale and scope in the cultural industries. We have brands and quality signals due to the experience, good attributes of works that are very important in interdependent demand formation. And more recently, people have been discussing network effects and multi-sided markets a lot in the cultural sector. All of these give rise to advantages of, of large enterprises. And one very important point I always like to make is that the idea of disintermediation and frictionless markets should really be shelved. Um, 
the cultural sector and with digitalization has sidelined and reduced the market power of some traditional centralized elements of the industry along the value chain, like say music distributors or movie distributors, for instance. Um, but uh, it's absolutely clear that the tools by which we circumvent the side roads, which are now the big highways of the culture sector, um, the, the online platforms are clearly self-interested, profit-oriented market um, and enterprises, and they have potential market power, maybe even actual market power in some, part, uh, in some markets already. Then third, we have positive externalities, mostly positive externalities. We could debate whether some cultural works have negative externalities too, and other public good attributes, which again will be the focus in the second part of my presentation. Um, and what one might add, make me make a constructive suggestion. This is all very conventional, but I think that sooner or later, the problems that arise due to intrinsic motivation to create might well become something like a new type of market failure. That markets don't really work well when workers really care about um, uh, the work conditions and the, um, the quality of cultural products. And that might give rise to sustainability issues in markets because there's you know, over exploitation or whatever. Now, this is half baked, but um, I just wanted to indicate that um, there might be potential to even understand what we think we know about how markets work and how they fail when we continue studying the cultural sector. That would be my hope anyway of um, and my measure of the most successful participants in cultural economics. Any questions so far? I'm going, I'm going to ch change over and uh, develop a much narrower focus otherwise on the aforementioned copyright compensation systems. Okay, that was enough time. I'm still ready to be interrupted um, as you see fit. So here's the beginning of part two. We have copyright compensation systems to mitigate conundrums in current cultural industries. What I've, I mean, apart from giving an overview, the main message was that it's a bloody mess. And we can say, wow, that's exciting. Let's roll up our sleeves. There's something to learn here. Uh, or we could say, you know, let's move to manufacturing industries, even though they only make up whatever it is these days. 10% of the economy, 50% of the economy, because they're more convenient, because Adam, Adam Smith already talked about them. Now, obviously, I'm of the letter, um, I'm of the letter type. So, um, so can we make constructive suggestions based on that? And here's my, here's my very ambitious and one which I'm sure you will be uh, trying to put, uh, well, able to um, um, poke some holes into as well as we when we actually engage in a discussion. So the big bigger question in which I see this presentation is the, the question on how we can make the best of digitalization regarding the cultural sector. We want to enable access, technical innovation and broad participation that you don't need to be an economist to have these kind of aims, but I think this is perfectly consistent with with uh, economics as well. And we want to sustain pecuniary incentives to create. Um, I used to have the little side note where they are needed, uh, but um, yeah, I, I guess it's clear that um, that the the barriers or the, the, the division between um, commercial activity, where people really are in it for the money, and um, well, voluntary work amateur activity and so on are blurring and I think we need to be aware of that when we try to get ahead around the cultural sector. I mentioned two papers here um, and that my presentation is based on mostly it's the former, but there are extensions of using the same data set that have been published elsewhere and that cover I mean I'm going to be talking recorded music. Um, the follow up work also included um, uh, books fiction books and uh, audiovisual entertainment. Okay, 
So, um, here's a little intro. Um, we talked about the market failure and the provision of uh, private provision of quasi public works, and uh, which is probably has been as aggravated by the division diffusion of digital information communication technology. This is so standard to me and so standard to you know some of the clever people uh, in this room that I'm gonna skip over that unless they're like in depth questions that you know I can't do it all. Um, but if you wanna need some need some help in, in in connecting to some of this please interrupt me now um if we have this kind of market failure and and unauthorized copying becomes much cheaper um according to the law of supply we would expect some problems in the long run and he's, uh, and we would want any kind of policy that fosters right holder profits that might boost or safeguard quality and quantity of supply and ideally creators and suppliers creators or suppliers and users would benefit in the long run from any kind of measure and the obvious measure that people have been toying with and have been trying to do in the early days after napster in the summer of 1999 for instance was increased investments in copyright enforcement statutory or or private poland was i almost said blacklisted it's not the official term but it was blacklisted by the united states for a while for um, not insufficient uh, fight against uh, music piracy, as far as I recall. There's this uh, two or three report or something like that by the, 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 the um, Foreign Ministry of the United States. Um, so that was, that was a big struggle there. And these days uh, we've moved on to trying to have commercial alternatives to, to unauthorized copying. Now, I'll talk about yet another alternative, right? Rather than online music services um, as we have them now, as commercial uh, enterprises that conduct private uh, contracts, establish private contracts with rights holders or their representatives, I'll be talking about uh, copyright compensation systems, uh, which are private, uh, which are arrangements in which uh, private internet subscribers get the right to download and use works online. Whatever they find online is fine, as long as they pay a fee. And we have these kinds of arrangements, uh, copying levies uh, for photocopying machines in many uh, parts of the world, for music cassettes in many parts of the world, they were charged for CD uh, ROMs, uh, they were charged and so on. But we haven't taken, like once the physical carrier was gone and the machine in the library office it wasn't really the way to access many works anymore we haven't took it to, we haven't a, a employed this yet um, um for to couple this with internet subscription and this is the um not my idea this is something that especially legal scholars in the united states in the early zero years uh, were uh, were uh, promoting, developing, and and promoting, but the empirical evidence uh, of of for this, whether this would work, what the consequences would be, was really incredibly flimsy, and I don't think we can blame policymakers that they never really went for it. So the basic question we asked us uh, a while ago um, was whether we would uh, whether a copyright compensation system for recorded music would be, could would be welfare increasing under current market conditions of the of the Netherlands uh, around the year 2014. And a little autobiographic note here: when I got the call whether I was willing to participate in this project. I was told that there was a big sum of money on the table and it would, you know, get me some perks. And I was so gobsmacked that somebody would finance this because I generally thought, oh my God, that it's so obvious that this is not going to work. We have online music subscription services coming up. Um, we have, um, we have private end users that at the end of the day don't really coordinate with each other and are probably going to succumb to free rider incentives and so on. But okay, if the Netherlands scientific organization wants to pay me for, for showing once and for all that this won't work, how unfortunate ever that may be, fair enough. And as you can see, um, in the course of this research, I was happy to eat my word and come around and now I think that the evidence couldn't be clearer that this is actually something that should really, should really be uh, experimentally adopted. 
<clears throat> okay, some more on the uh, attributes of a copyright compensation system, so you uh, get a clear idea of what I have in mind here. Uh, first of all, um, copyright compensation systems differ from direct market transactions in several aspects. The typical suggestion is a levy on copying technology, or in this case, Today, internet services, internet subscription of households for non-commercial use of uh, copyright works. The difference would be that copying levies so far did not legalize unauthorized use. You paid, but you got nothing in return, right? You paid because you were suspect <laughs> for copying levies. At least that's the situation in the countries that I'm familiar with. If it's different in Poland, I'd love to hear about it. But that's certainly in the case in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the UK. Um, now the suggestion so so users would actually get something they would get they would be scot free online yeah they could they could uh, do whatever they please as long as they um as long as they pay their copying levy the, anything they find online is fine yeah um this shifts the compensation incidence from the use of non excludable goods i e all everything you find online often at your fingertips whether it's authorized or not to more excludable related goods, in this case, internet subscription, which is clearly an exclu um, excludable good. And practice, this requires, and let's not lie about this, right? Somebody has to take care of this, and it, that would be uh, collective management organizations, as they're usually called. So Stoart or um, Zykes uh, in Poland, for instance, Uma Stemmer in the Netherlands. And when we conducted our research, we did not lie about this. We drew the attention to our respondents who evaluated these compensation systems. Um, um, we, we made it very clear that this would be run through an organization, through Buma Stemra, we varied the treatment sometimes, or an organization like Buma Stemra. That's very important. Not least because, of course, these organizations, like most organizations, um, um, are yeah, well, a, a real world phenomena, they don't always, they, they don't always have um, a perfect immaculate reputation. I get to that in a minute, and I hope nobody here takes offense. Um, so we need a central intermediary platform that reduces complexity or average transaction costs in a given market by bundling of transactions and standardized terms of trade. And the main criticism of either collective rights management or a copyright compensation system, which is a particular version, an expansion of the, the almost pervasive phenomenon of, um, of collective rights management that we have in parts of the cultural sector. The main criticisms are that you would offset the market mechanism and inhibit responsiveness to change. That is why we studied voluntary participation on the user side, in addition to mandatory, mandatory participation. I'll get to that in a minute. And the other one would be that we just don't trust existing organizations or any further organizations regulated by the government uh, or with commercial interests to do this reasonably well, because it would require quite some centralized control, right? The, the whole one of the main points would be that you would do bundling and standardization, which would entail standardized control that many people um, abhor for good reasons. I'm an economist. I abhor centralized control, too. But the question is whether we can actually avoid it in the cultural sector. And when you look at the uh, market concentration ratios in many parts of the internet based services and uh, inc increasingly also the cultural sector, then you get to see that it's not a binary choice between um, uh, decentralized um, uh, markets or, um, uh, say, highly concentrated quasi monopolies with collective uh, rights management, but it actually you, are, you have more of a choice between narrow oligopoly that's for profit, or maybe even quasi monopolies that are for profit and quasi monopolies that are heavily regulated and have some kind of collective rights holder and management uh, element in them. I still haven't managed to say something so provocative that anybody wants to protest. Fair enough. Okay, I'll I'll just continue. Um, a few words in the context of the uh, of the um, the Netherlands. The data was collected in late 2013. I would hasten to add that there are some reasons to take this data um, as not being entirely outdated. 
Um, let me argue why. First of all, we have some headline figures uh, for the Netherlands that annual sales value of recorded music to end users was about 140 million um, um, at around the time. Um, that was that is the number for 2012, I think, but these numbers didn't change all that much. That was like post post uh, unauthorized copying, post Napster and Kazaa and so on, post file sharing apocalypse. Uh, for the music industry, where sales um, sales value in value terms uh, dropped by about 50%, like in many other major markets, and then stabilized around that a few years later. Um, now, and to give you a reason to, to continue listening, our results suggest that the music industry revenues could be more than twice, uh, three times as high, while still leaving users by and large better off. So here's a reason to listen, perhaps. There's lots of money on the table. Um, so market conditions in the Netherlands make this result particularly noteworthy. Um, first of all, unauthorized private copying from unlawful so sources was not outlawed. So people could without, there was not a single user who had ever been uh, taken to court, let alone um, uh, deemed culpable um, of copyright infringements, as long as it wasn't commercial. Um, yeah, so so basically, what pe the willingness to pay the people report for for participating in a copyright compensation system is against the backdrop of the alternative of just doing as you damn please, and you might explain that with some enlightened self interest that they actually want to support creativity, right? Because they might actually understand uh, the long term consequences of um, of rampant unauthorized copying. Second, there was a very advanced digitalization at the time of data collection already in the Netherlands. 95% of households with internet access uh, had internet access at the time, majority of which was broadband already. And 31% of the recorded music revenues was also already from digital distribution, as it was called by the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry, IFPI at the time, and most of which came from ad supported or subscription based online music services. I don't know what the numbers are in, uh, in Poland these days. But 95% penetration rate of broadband internet and 31% recorded music revenues from digital distribution, you don't have to go that much into the past in Germany to find the corresponding years. And it, it is much closer to, to the current situation. Um, um, does anybody know about the Polish uh, numbers, roughly? Uh, well, for now, I think... Uh... The digital revenues slightly uh, became la larger than the physical revenues, but that only seems to have happened now with the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, seems like in Poland, for most of the time, the physical revenues were actually larger than the digital ones. And I remember that because I've been looking at this data that in 2019, I think there was actually an increase in the share of physical revenues driven by vinyl sales. Uh, so yeah, but yeah. now it seems that digital is gaining the majority. Okay, so I uh, thank you for that uh, for that uh, additional info. So we what we can see is that um, this is not hopelessly outdated in terms of these key headline figures of uh, of the market, because it's for instance also in Germany, which is hasn't been particularly fast in digitalization um, of late. Um, these numbers. Again, was we're also. I mean, this is this. We weren't even close in 2013 to these kind of figures. So it was an interesting case to study the Netherlands, and means that the data, the the, the half time of this data, isn't quite as horrible as you might think, as we're talking technological change and digitalization. Now, our results uh, illustrate substantial valuation or willingness to pay for participation in a copyright compensation uh, system for recorded music, in spite of. Virtually no legal risk. Let me drive that, repeat that message because it's important. It will save us some time in the subsequent discussion. In spite of virtually no legal risk associated with non-commercial piracy and in spite of availability and widespread use of authorized online music services, including music subscriptions. The respondents were aware of these alternatives. Can I have a question? Yeah, of course you can. Uh, so, 
Is it still the case in Netherlands that it is uh, legal to copy or was this changed? This is mm. my one question. Okay. Wait, this. If there's one thing I learned uh, over the years working at the Institute for Information Law at University of Amsterdam, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, that's my second leg in, in uh, my second home base in, in academia uh, in next to Erasmus University. And if there's one thing I learned that these kind of questions, if you, I mean, I can give you a sim simple answer and I could tell you that I don't think that there's any disincentive that's effective. Yeah. But what the situation is by law, Jesus Christ, that, <laughs> yeah. So please, I, as a social scientist or economist, I would say, I don't see any, any, any substantial, substantial threat. Yeah. For people engaging in unauthorized copying. Um, but, uh, there've been several reforms and I'm pretty sure the Dutch government might be horrified if I said there is nothing going on because obviously they had to adapt uh, tra yeah, transposition uh, various EU directives by now that kind of oblige um, uh, EU member states to, well, to take adequate measures to inhibit unauthorized copying. Okay, sorry, very straightforward, very relevant question that doesn't have a very simple answer. To my understanding, enforcement is uh, not effective. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just one small. Yeah, please. When you say uh, that the copyright wasn't isn't uh, that is sorry that copying isn't outlawed, you mean that both sharing and downloading or? Um, downloading was definitely okay, and it was not okay because people paid a copying levy, which they did and do, right? Um, so they pay copying levies on computer hardware and media hardware and so on. Um, but that didn't mean that it was okay. It wasn't because of that, that it was okay to do unauthorized copying. It was just that, that nothing in the, uh, nothing in the, um, statutes nor in the enforcement measures by the government, um, forced platforms or you know internet service providers or telecommunication firms to reveal the identity of people who conducted unauthorized copying online i'm not aware of a single case but this is really i'm beyond uh, out of my depth here to some extent uh, but um, i'm not aware even of cases where uploading would have been prosecuted but you might want to double check that with uh, you know i can get you in touch with <laughs> with the relevant people if you want uh, if you want to double check that that's okay. I was just curious. Downloading certainly was not associated with any noticeable legal risk. I stand by that. And that's the most relevant for the interpretation of our uh, empirical results. It's kind of a worst case scenario for introducing a copyright compensation system, right? Um, it's saying you, you get something for free, now you have to pay for it. Yeah. How much would you like to pay? That's basically what we did. Uh, so that you get, you get, we'll get to that in a second, right? To the actual results, uh, and the, that the number is uh, uh, is clearly distinct from zero, or or, or just simply piss off, <coughs> uh, is is already something I would say. Okay, so uh, the methods we employed are uh, quite ambitious, and we we really uh, burned through a lot of cash uh, in the process. Um, I certainly, you know, it's not hard to repeat this, I have to admit. Uh, so we did a contingent valuation through a discrete choice experiment. And just to note that contingent valuation studies are a central tool in cultural economics. For a while, the nickname of the Journal of Cultural Economics was Journal of Applied Contingent Valuation Studies. Um, and uh, so, you know, it is really a central method in cultural economics. So it's a method to try and establish the value in monetary terms, translate into monetary terms, the total social, cultural, um, economic value of goods that are either not traded yet, as you would do when you develop a new innovative product, or that are untradeable, for instance, because they are public goods, pure public goods. Yeah. Um, and that's a central challenge in, in cultural economics. 
Now we covered a wide range of copyright compensation options so that we could identify and focus on the most promising combination of copyright compensation systems and not just the scale of our endeavor, but these two steps that I just mentioned yeah, that we really um, um, adopted the state of the art ways of valuing non traded untraded goods or services and covering lots of options to pick the best combination of attributes of a copyright compensation system uh, really meant that we did something that way, went way beyond what had been done regarding empirical work on, on this subject. And just to be sure, as with any stated preference method, this is a stated preference method and the, uh, all economists in the room will now say, ooh, okay, the data is fishy, right? Uh, and the, yes, indeed, they have the data, uh, 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 stated preference methods uh, and the data generated in them has to be interpreted with caution. But meta studies, um, we did a little uh, analysis and looked at several meta studies of, uh, of the literature, and they found that overestimation of the willingness to pay by is usually by a factor of 3.3, uh, including high outliers, however, and the median would be 1.5, the most current um, um, uh, overestimation amount. How, on average, no over, there is no overestimation, however, when you have modest amounts. Uh, so um, uh, hypothetical values of lower than 10 US dollars. And that is the, where the bulk of our responses come from. So, um, I'll, in, in, but I'll mention the cautiousness that is in, in order in a minute. Now, what follows now will continue to be a bit on the technical level. And I will be ruthless in being quick about it, right? Because I'm not sure whether many people of you are interested uh, in, in, lots of, in lots of technical detail, please interrupt me. I'm happy to go with the flow of, of the feedback I receive live here today, but um, I will be a bit quick about, um, about some of the technical stuff, but open to, to questions at all times. So here's an overview of the kinds of um, uh, scenarios we introduced, so variations in the treatments we had in the uh, in the choice experiments. So we gave people an option to say, um, here are two options. Which one would you prefer? Or here are three options. One, uh, two have are combinations of these different kinds of attributes, randomly or not entirely randomly, but but generated such that we could later estimate the marginal effects of each of these attributes. And um, often there was the zero option of saying, I will go for neither, which would be the zero response. They, you know, they prefer the current situation without a copyright compensation system. And um, again, this is a tried and tested method, which is tedious to implement, but which tends to be associated when there were opportunities to conduct this kind of research and then later check that to actual behavior in markets and it was actually it is rather precise when you have enough responses and when you get the technique right so there are lots of variations here the main point is that we picked the best one of these that seemed realistic and then most associated with the highest valuation of willingness to pay as reported by our respondents by accepting certain offers we had a representative sample of the Dutch population, including those without internet uh, connection. There was even a pecuniary reward. This is like a, a, the list panel administered by Center Data, which is like the representative um, um, longitudinal uh, panel study, which always feeds in special questions in addition to the demographic questions that are updated all the time with this, uh, with this panel. And uh, yeah, we were very happy that we could uh, use these professional services and tap into this, uh, into this very professionally administered panel. There were 6,260 panel members and uh, almost 5,000 completed choice experiments, which puts us in the highest quartile in terms of response rates. And some indication of non-response bias still exists. For instance, non-respondents are significantly younger, which may be associated with an underestimation of average willingness to pay across the entire population, because amongst the young people that did respond, they had a much higher willingness to pay on average than older people for a copyright compensation system. Um, so here's some 
initial basic results. The big question is, of course, you know, how much are people willing to pay? Um, but uh, some some more preliminary basic results. Uh, so for recorded music with fixed payment, with a fixed payment treatment, so um, you would not be monitored in your behavior and charged accordingly, but more like online music subscription services, you pay a fixed amount at the beginning of a month, and then you can do whatever you please. The volume is unrestricted. And without a guaranteed share of revenues for original, cre original creators, so without saying uh, original creators definitely get 10% or 20% of the uh, collected amounts, the CCS option most likely to be preferred over the status quo was uh, allowed users that you had download and share, but not modification rights. People did not care for those. Um, you had a completeness of catalog. Obviously, they wanted that rather than temporal restrictions that some stuff would only be available uh, a bit later after release because people want to sell records or, you know, other ways of uh, sell via other channels. Uh, and there would be no monitoring of the users, which you don't really need when you don't have to monitor the amount of use to give like a, uh, to charge by a use metric. To be so, some surprising results here already, modification rights were, you know, did not do anything on average. People didn't want it, didn't want to pay for it or didn't appreciate it all that much. Maybe that would have, maybe that's one thing that might have changed these days with all this memeing thing and so on and even more user generated content. And um, it was very difficult to discuss a guaranteed revenue uh, share for original creators like we have in some parts of the collective uh, rights management system. Uh, because when we gave realistic numbers, like 10 or 20%, people took offense and said, you know, creators should get everything or creators should get at least 50%, which, um, uh, yeah, for various reasons, we didn't want to suggest because it seems really, really rather unrealistic, as you may know, way below 10% on average, right? That, that the actual creators, the, the recording artists and the uh, composers or lyricists receive in the established music industry. I don't think that has changed very much over recent years. Most of the money goes to intermediaries, and we can discuss the economic justification and the, uh, and the um, how palatable and nice that seems to be or not. But that's not really my point today. So this is the copyright compensation system option for which I estimate or we estimated the effects on users and rights holders. Here are the uh, predicted values, the typical probability of acceptance. I, as we started analyzing the data, you get the overview of mon mandatory, voluntary, and voluntary coupled with stricter copyright enforcement. They're not all that distinct. If you look, um, if you look at it, uh, the 95% um, confidence intervals are reasonably narrow. And um, let's go right to the um, to the more fundamental results, like or the, the formalization interpretation of the results. First of all, no mandatory copyright compensation system will be generally welfare increasing. So the whole idea of Pareto optimality, yeah, making somebody better off without making anybody worse off is, um, yeah, that's, that's not how you can evaluate this. It, that's just not going to work. I say this so clearly, because I don't think that works anywhere in the culture sector because of the multitude of market failures. You will always find somebody who loses with whatever changed cultural uh, policy, copyright policy, whatever you make. So the blackboard world, the, 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 the purely academic theorizing world of priority optimality is not that relevant here. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm citing the late Mark Blauk on this point who was famous historian of economic thought, as well as one of the founding fathers of cultural economics who said that early on. So we need to have uh, be a bit more flexible, and that would be the Calder-Hicks compensation test, which is the relevant aspect of economic theory if you're new to the uh, application of welfare economics to the cultural sector. Okay, so uh, none of them will be generally welfare increasing, uh, but user willingness to uh, user willingness to pay is too varied. There is a sizable number of people who really don't want this, right? So many people would say, "A oh, bloody hell!" Even if it's one euro fifty or two euros as a surcharge on my internet subscription, um, you know, I that's a loss for me because my willingness to pay is virtually zero, or at least below one fifty or two euros. Um, 
price discrimination and or product differentiation could be um, um, uh, will be restricted uh, in practice. So you can't really get ar around that problem. It's not that only pensioners have a zero willingness to pay or only students have a, a high willingness to pay. It's a bit more mixed, right? So we can't get around this, this uh, problem with, um, uh, with group pricing, for instance. And a median user willingness to pay for any copyright compensation system covered is to reject it. So yeah, then we only the lowest price point we checked was uh, was uh, five euros actually, which in retrospect uh, could have been re refined, but we wanted equidistant and we wanted to go up to thirty euros. So that's where we ended up. Um, there's a lot of things going on between five euros and uh, and zero euros. So um, that is a bit of a gap in our knowledge that you eventually have, but yeah, let me spot it here. Um, so you have, there's an estimation procedure we use to estimate the uh, well, welfare implications of a, um, um, of a corporate compensation system that is mandatory on the user side, so people have to pay that surcharge. Um, first, we estimated the mean willingness to pay, which marks the maximum price at which this specific corporate compensation system would pass the Calder Hicks compensation test regarding only users. So those who gain uh, would be willing to compensate, at least in theory, those who lose. Second, we calculate the aggregate user value and the potential revenues that uh, could be generated by the copyright compensation system for this option. Third, we deduct estimated costs of operating the copyright compensation system. We did not ignore that, you know, we have to operate the uh, CMO. And fourth, we compare estimated copyright compensation system revenues to right holder revenues under the status quo. Admittedly, you know, after the uh, after the uh, Napster apocalypse, but uh, yeah, that's where we were. And um, so we can thus establish whether a copyright compensation system could simultaneously make users and rights holders at large better off. And so here's the estimation procedure. If anybody wants to double check on me, I'm happy to return to this slide. I'm going to skip that now for obvious reasons, right? The rule of thumb is that any equation in, a, in an article reduces the uh, number of readers by half. Let's not fall into that trap here. I'm looking at the participant number. It's not changing, not changing yet. So uh, here, the second uh, equation. Um, here, I am um, just briefly saying that we did a conservative estimation of mean user willingness to pay. So if anybody who said no, consistently said no to five euros was charged as having zero willingness to pay, anybody who only ever accepted anything at five euros was then, um, uh, his willingness to pay was calculated as five euros, not as somewhere between five and 10, yeah? And um, so thus we, in this um, instance, as well as several other choices, we try to consistently develop a conservative estimate of the willingness to pay for a copyright compensation system by respondents. There are some um, um, parameters that we used um, that I don't have to read out. Um, if you want to double check on any of these, I will bring back that, um, uh, that slide. And here, lo and behold, we be, we're beginning to look at the main result for a mandatory compensation system. In gray, you see the main things that you really need to look at, I suppose. Mean willingness to pay amongst our respondents was nine um, euros 25, uncannily similar to the 9.99 that mu online music subscription services are charging. Um, probably just a coincidence. And the price at which rights holders um, would have been or would be fully compensated was one euro 75, 74 per household. Yeah, so we were also cautious there, not assuming that individuals would, uh, would pay a surcharge, but it would be households, obviously, and only households who have internet subscription. Um, and assuming that um, um, the uh, internet penetration rate wouldn't be strongly affected. Now, what this leads what this leads to is a change in rights holder uh, revenues. If you go to the upper price, where there's no the welfare effect on the user side, in theory, is around around about zero. They're not worse off, but they're not better off. You could generate an additional six hundred and twenty one million euros per year. They're currently having 
sales revenues of 174 million. Or you could increase uh, the aggregate effect on user welfare. The, the, the welfare effect would be even greater if you go to the lower price where all the surplus would be appropriated by the Dutch users. Okay, so that's the, um, sorry, the, um, your faces are in the way of the last one. Okay, so those are the, the those are the aggregate figures. And I suppose any meaningful policy would probably find the price point somewhere in between. Um, but it's a pretty large range, right? 174 to 925 uh, gives, gives a large range of possible prices one could start with. Okay, that's the mandatory part. Um, that confirms prior research, but it's uh, the, 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 the detail and the precision is much greater than in prior research. A really entirely novel part in, ter in terms of um, uh, empirical evidence is the discussion of a voluntary copyright compensation system option. And with a voluntary copyright compensation system, there's no negative effect on the user on user welfare, as low willingness to pay users do not simply do not participate. They can opt out. Of course, then perhaps facing the legal risk when they um, conduct unauthorized copying, if in the future perhaps there would be stronger copyright protection in the Netherlands as well. Um, Anyway, second bullet point, uh, without changes to the strength of copyright enforcement among users, key results, and they're slightly different here, the calculation procedure, but we don't have to go to the details. The key results are that the revenue maximizing price uh, would be 23 euros 42. That's, you know, if you have monopolistic pricing, seems a bit steep. You would have then not quite a quarter of households participating according to our results and an annual change in rights holder revenues of 430, uh, around about 440 million, and user surplus of 112 million. And fully comp and the fully compensating price, if you only charged 174 per month uh, per household, you would have 45% roughly of households participating and no effect on rights holder revenues and use a surplus of, a prob uh, of probably greater than 720. Nine million per year. Again, it's a not the Netherlands are a mid-sized country at best. Certainly, a lot smaller than Poland in terms of um, in terms of um, population. And so, the, for the for the Dutch record industry, these are humongous numbers. Uh, the treatment invoking stronger copyright enforcement, incidentally, among users who opted out has no significant effect and maybe there's some potential for, for protest bias, yeah, that people didn't like that option or didn't want to, you know, fathom it, uh, that it was possible that at some point there would be uh, copyright enforcement, but we tried to um, treat some respondents and make sure that they were aware that, the, um, that there was pressure on the Dutch government to, you know, instigate stronger copyright enforcement. So we're nearly nearing completion of what I have prepared for today. Um, here's a short, incomplete list of extensions and limitations. And I really think that you can probably help me uh, to extend on some of these. Um, so first of all, Costs of rights holders are probably lower with corporate compensation systems than under the status quo. Yeah. So, well, sorry, some of the extensions and limitations, as you might note, um, as we try to be conservative, as I discuss these extensions and limitations here, some of these suggest that the results might even be more dramatically positive. Uh, that doesn't hold for every single bullet point, but for most of them, actually. So I'm, you know, I've really come around and I really think this <laughs> We have a strong signal, as good as it gets, before you actually try this in practice. It doesn't get, I don't think, I couldn't think how it could get much better in terms of a signal that this might be, um, might be ripe for experimental adoption. Okay, so we have cost of rights holders are probably low with copyright competition system than under the status quo because the marketing, the benefits of CCAs may be greater than in our calculations because the marketing costs and the reproduction costs and so on would just be, you know, would not be all that great for the rights holders. Certainly then in the, uh, in the physical market, 
probably even in terms of all the negotiations that are going on, all the bargaining and monitoring and enforcing and amongst platforms and rights holders and so on, maybe we could save some um, some expenditure there too. If we align the interests of all parties uh, in uh, maximizing the amount of that people are using because use is compensated for quite generally. You have long-term effects on the supply of new creative works that might not be fully incorporated into the valuation of users. So if you would really raise a couple hundred million extra in terms of revenues to the Dutch music industry, or, you know, some of it, of course, would go across the pond United States, let's be honest, but um, um, it's not clear to what extent users fully anticipate any positive effects on the supply of new creative works. Third, the price discrimination and product differentiation may further boost the benefits of corporate compensation systems. It's not so easy that you would simply do group pricing and uh, and omit pensioners entirely, and then you solve all the problems. But some of this uh, could certainly be done and make it even even more uh, create even greater surplus. We conservatively assume perfect substitution for conventional purchases of recorded music, so we assume that um, anybody who participates in the CCS has zero other purchases, which is, you know, probably a great exaggeration, but leads to a more conservative, more cautious estimation of the effects. Um, this is what we intended to be cautious. <clears throat> and some of the non-recorded music stuff like live uh, events and licensing of commercial for commercial use and merchandise and so on are not included in the assessment. Uh, fifth, online music services would obviously be affected, and I would argue that they uh, would have to compete under such a system, under CCS, on their own price and music-related services they offer, not on their ability to establish beneficial license terms from rights holders, which I think would be a great boon, because it would create a solution, an elegant solution to the problem of not competitive and maybe even not very contestable markets for online for online platforms that many people are worried about these days because um, these firms could hardly adopt exclusivity strategies and they could hardly adopt strategies where they um, leverage any market power to get beneficial uh, conditions from rights holders and thus creating barriers to entry so i think this would be a great boon but this has been a most contentious issue as I've presented similar um, similar results elsewhere. Second to last, user-generated content could be rewarded and some non-commercial distribution by users could be allowed for, which I think would also be un unleashing that and finally, um, um, well, getting the good parts of the commercial world, namely that if you create too much value for others, that you have the, you know, a seamless, effortless change over into actually receiving some revenues. I think that would be a, a, a great potential boon of such a system. And finally, a voluntary compensation system can only increase demand for internet subscription uh, because people could opt out. And in any case, it is improbable that mandatory compensation system within the reasonable range of prices would have a strong negative effect on demand for internet subscription because with at least some competition between telecommunication firms, the um, prices for internet subscription are probably well in the inelastic range to allow for some jargon. And here's my second to last slide, the conclusions on part two. A well-designed compensation system for recorded music could simultaneously make users and rights holders better off. That is the result that the, the best res the, the result we can we get from our best efforts regarding stated preferences. I'm aware of the limitations. Uh, now in the Netherlands, the fully compensating monthly CCS fee is about 175, right? So that's a nice take-home measure. And a conservative estimate of mean willingness to pay is 995 and 925. So a multiple, even for a mandatory system. And this result holds up to an overestimation by a factor of 5.3, if you just do the division, uh, which is greater than the highest mean willingness to pay overestimation reported in any relevant meta studies. And our values are relatively low. So the probability that we have any overestimation or the, the, the mean overestimation at our price points is way below two. 
And given these results, experimental adoption of a CCS is highly desirable. And you could obviously roll this out with this uh, random sample of users, for instance, or in a small country that feel, where the government feels daring or whatever, right? But um, the signal could not get stronger before you actually try this. Not much stronger anyway, right? You can always have higher, higher numbers, but uh, I mean, the factor is pretty impressive, I think. And the overall conclusions, as I had two parts in this presentation. First of all, uh, the cultural sector constitutes an imposing and inspiring challenge to economists, but it is a growing field. Um, so, you know, you're, you're joining the bandwagon and maybe something that uh, develops momentum and becomes more and more interesting to many people, also very senior people that, uh, that uh, published on related subjects and also in the Journal of Cultural Economics and related journals. Um, with swift and broad technological change, things get harder and even more socially relevant. I suppose my uh, presentation is a case in point. I, was, I appreciate that I went into a very uncertain territory and which leads me to my third point that this is a far out idea. That's the reaction I keep getting. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, it's a far out idea to mitigate some of the pervasive market failures in cultural industries. However, I think once you under, once we get ahead around the peculiarities and the multiple challenges we face in the cultural sector and in organizing it in a, in a way that seems reasonably efficient, um, maybe far out ideas are required. And fourth and finally, to form your own opinion or to develop alternatives on what I suggested, for instance, on how to make the best of digitalization in the cultural industries, I very much suggest building on cultural economics. I am dead tired of another paper, for instance, on music piracy that ignores uh, the really extensive, virtually conclusive evidence that creativity, for instance, is to a large extent intrinsically motivated, right? I mean, it's just, and, and, and yeah, so I have a huge literature on, on music piracy and movie piracy and some of the most basic um, relevant insights that are that are um, have been developed for decades and discussed for decades and fine-tuned for decades keep being ignored, um, which I find really frustrating. And I really think it's uh, it's um, inhibiting progress in cultural economics and uh, in other parts of economics. Well, you heard me out. Uh, thanks for that. Let's see whether I provoked somebody uh, enough after all. Otherwise, I come up with some random rant in a minute. Thank you very much for this great and very comprehensive presentation. Uh, we actually have some questions already uh, from uh, Jan Namazur and from Christian Weckert. Uh, so please, uh, Jan, I was first, I think. Mm. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. And yeah, I have a question because I was wondering what would be your hypothesis concerning the possible impact of the development of streaming platforms that we've seen in last years on the willingness to pay? Because I know it's uh, you know more about audiovisual content than about music, but I think to a certain extent also it relates to music. And I was thinking that maybe actually because we got more used to paying for content and because it is tiring to buy access to so many different platforms, our willingness to pay would be even greater because of the way that this market is shaped currently. So just, yeah. 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 Asking for some thoughts, you know. <laughs> yes, yeah, great. Uh, nice to see you, Johanna. Um, now, um, you know, we can go through the theory of demand and think about, you know, related goods and services and maybe even taste and taste formation, which normally, you know, is assumed to be constant. And in cultural economics, sometimes we dare to think that we can anticipate that preferences change in a reliable manner that almost looks like changes in taste, like more permanent changes. Um, uh, more, more well, durable changes. Now, um, now, what's clear is that the market for audiovisual content is fragmented. That you have multiple platforms. You don't have one platform um, that gives you universal access to anything you fancy. And it's very clear that with taste for variety, it's peculiar in the culture sector. We really like 
while there are lots of very close substitutes amongst larger group of people, individuals tend to uh, develop urgent preferences. Yeah, they really want the one movie that they read about and that excites them, right? I want to see whatever, right? Um, a movie on, on gay cowboys, Brockback Mountain. It needs to be Brockback Mountain. If I have a Disney Plus subscription and it's not on Disney Plus, then I'm frustrated, right? Or I want to watch Barcelona versus Real Madrid. Um, um, so I need another platform for it. So it's really frustrating and it might drive people into unauthorized um, content. And that's always the, the fallback that but also explain the low prices we see um, paid out to many rights holders. Um, in the music industry, that's that's more obvious um, because the rates are actually known, like the you know the tenth of a cent per view or something on on uh, on the online subscription services. That the alternative is nearly always driving people into unauthorized uh, access. I don't know so much. I mean, I would be cautious to say this could be even better. Um, um, simply because I, I think that as I'm a proponent of this, and as I would really like to see it adopted, the one problem that I see strategically in a strategic communication is that you look like your exaggeration. If you look at your exaggeration, the whole argument might be, might be discredited. So I would be very cautious and I would just simply withhold any kind of more ambitious predictions and say it could, it could even be better and so on or circumstances have changed i would say we need maybe one or two more empirical studies maybe in other territories and if those deliver the consistent results we should really seriously consider this i think concern for market power of online platforms and centralized control over a cultural life let's let aside let's ignore the rest of society i think that's the one thing that is bringing this to well uh, that that makes this idea ripen further right and become more and more enticing that's how i see this going um i hope this was a reasonable response to your question you see how i wasn't i didn't dare to say yes or no totally <laughs> the reasoning behind your your question makes and your hypothesis makes perfect sense um our result for audiovisual suggested that there was considerable scope to make more revenues, generate more revenues without making users worse off at the time in the Netherlands. But it wasn't quite as extreme. Thanks. And yeah, I think there was somebody else with the question, so I mute myself. Uh, thank you. So uh, Christian Poker, please. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your surname. No, no worries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's it's Poikert, So, uh, but you know, it's it's uh, even for Germans difficult to say. <laughs> so, um, thanks for this uh, very inspiring uh, uh, talk, Christian. Um, I'm I've been a big fan of that paper for for a long time, so I really liked it. Um, I let me challenge you though uh, a little bit. Um, so. Um, so I, I basically have three questions on um, on what you're proposing. The first is, I guess, the elephant in the room. How do you distribute the income from the com, uh, from the voluntary or compulsory uh, system to the artists? And how do you make sure that uh, sort of it's fair? Uh, and one solution to that would be that you sort of you need to sort of collect data on what people are actually consuming, um, and then have a you know have a way to. Uh, really distributed uh, accordingly to artists. And that's, I think, what I'm gathering, very difficult task, um, and even more difficult if you have, a, a, you know, a, a whole range of ways now you can get access to content, including unlicensed platforms, uh, and so on. And then it just feels like it's going to create some kind of sort of the same problem that we have with um, uh, the collection societies um, in the old days before they had all the usage data where then also the artists complained that you know my song is being played on the radio it's Robbie Williams who, who gets the royalties and so on so that would be my first question yeah um, a great question um, and the uh, the short answer is that we're already doing it to some extent right 
and this gets bet, get easier and better. I mean, we're talking about online distribution here, right? So you would be the first, <laughs> I suppose, who could develop practical solutions for that. And of course, the collecting societies have not been sleeping either. And they've been developing more and more sophisticated uh, ways of doing this too. So obviously, you would have the big platforms report data. Yeah. Uh, to the collecting society that would manage this. And at the fringes, you could either use web scraping um, or other techniques to monitor things and to get people that uh, reach a certain threshold of, uh, of activity to also report data, which shouldn't be that costly because after all, it's all digital and it's about, you know, sending something in. But you could also do this even passively with web scraping and, you know, and just see how things are used. Now you could also do this on the end user side and there, obviously you do need not need to monitor 17.4 or seven, or whatever it is, 17 million Dutch people or 10 million Dutch households. You don't have to because you can go for a reasonably sized um, random sample of the population, obviously, right? And that might at the fringes create some injustices, that, but the probability that some in inequity, but the probability that you're a winner or a loser in the system should be, you know, should be, should even things out over time. And, and so I'm actually, I mean, obviously it's a hairy issue and it's never going to be um, quite as satisfying because of the degree of centralized control and more or less arbitrary choices about the methods made. Uh, it's never going to be perfectly satisfying. As satisfying as just saying, let's leave it all to uh, a supposedly neutral market. But I think the technical solutions are there and the costs of this in terms of either privacy um, limitations or um, or uh, the amount of data necessary to do to get your reasonable results, I think can be grossly overestimated. And um, yeah, I, I've been very curious to hear what you whether, you whether you want to hear a bit more about what I think about this and what other objections you might still have or whether I got you around um, thinking about this constructively. Yeah, no, no, I, I was just wondering sort of what your ideas would be. So I'm with you that this should be technically feasible, but then you know, um, I'm not sure that I agree that it's, you, you can you can overestimate, um, you know, how, how it, easy it is to implement in practice. So I don't know if this no. has changed, but from my, from my conversations with collecting societies just a couple of years ago, they really had huge problems just to match data that they got from different platforms that were like licensed and was fully in, 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 in their uh, uh, aligned with the incentives of the platforms to report data accurately. Yeah, I, I very much agree. This is, this is really a hairy issue, but that's a very important point, a general point. Evaluating a copyright compensation system against the vision of a perfect market where you do not have these problems is pointless. We need to compare it to what we have. And what we have right now is online platforms doing the very same thing, right? That we say that collecting societies somehow couldn't do, but they do it, right? And do you really think that somehow Spotify data, Deezer data, Amazon Music data is in any way better um, than what um, a heavily regulated collecting society uh, would bring up? It's an honest question. Um, yeah, so prob probably not. Uh, so, but this yeah. actually, it's, it's, it's very good that you bring this up because, I mean, I don't want to monopolize the time here, but um, so uh, feel free to stop me at any point. Uh, so, so it brings me to my second question, which is um, uh, basically, um, so do we need the system? Because now since 2013, sort of the market has changed. People are now adopting uh, streaming platforms. They kind of have this. Um, and this goes back to Joanna's question earlier, they, they kind of have this uh, subscription model and people pay for it and sort of, um, I don't know whether this is true for all, for all markets, but in some markets in, in music, piracy is basically no longer an issue. Um, uh, there are ad supported models and you know, people find their music and some people don't want to pay for it, uh, but artists are still uh, compensated more than zero. Uh, and so, so the question is sort of, whether you're describing a, a system that is now sort of 
the market has found something very similar to that. Yeah. Okay. So the empirical, based on the empirical evidence, I would argue that people at the time of data collection in the Netherlands were aware of and very often the same people who were already users of music subscription services had a clear preference to alternatively or in addition participate in a copyright compensation system. That's the empirical answer, right? Um, whether this has changed with the maturation of uh, online music services, whether they've become so much better that now this, um, this might have changed a lot uh, remains to be seen, but the empirical evidence, and it's the best we have on this, on this particular subject, is that in the presence of the option of online music subscriptions and even direct experience with them, they still have a preference, a willingness to pay a way, be, um, way above zero on average uh, for a corporate compensation system. The other issue is that piracy is an issue. It is a huge issue because it, it, it is the constant threat under which right holders and other people who invest heavily in, in uh, uh, cultural industries operate. Right, because the moment they don't, they get their act together. Or they fail to get a deal and get um, a, a good exposure online and so on. Um, they have to fear that unauthorized use will take over again. Now we talked about blockchain already. If we talk about blockchain, that relates back to your first question. It might everything very effective and maybe even efficient mm -hmm. keep with the monitoring. Right, then the whole monitoring thing. If any, if the more ambitious claims regarding blockchain technology and um, is true, then um, the, that problem that you alluded to first uh, goes away. Um, and uh, so, uh, so uh, I was talking about piracy being an issue, blockchain making the problem go away, but I wanted to extend to your current question again. Sorry, I'm losing my time of thought here. I've done a lot of talking. Could you help me, Christian? Um, oh. Again? Is, so, so my question was whether, so I, I, just to, illustrate, to say this one more time, I really like your idea that the idea that you're pushing in this paper. I'm just asking whether by now, um, sort of the market has found a similar solution yeah. and you don't need a centralized agency like yeah. a collection society to take care of that because it feels like music hasn't died. Uh, there's more music than there used to be ever before. It feels like people are, uh, consumers are paying for the music, uh, even those that have a uh, zero willingness to pay. They're not. They're also contributing by advertising by looking at ads. They're contributing to artist income and so on. So I'm wondering whether the system that you're describing sort of exists in a way that, but it's sort of born out of the market. Okay. So and uh, that's the last point. That is a question. How much we want to stomach um, centralized control by for-profit agents in these kind of markets. How optimistic are we that the, um, that the online uh, platforms are going to remain contestable and um, innovation intensive and so on in the future? That's a very absolutely key question. So I would be almost completely satisfied if we had this option in our back pocket in order to have some kind of response ready when we start seeing the evidence that there is really more or less well too long lasting and too intense market power and centralized control developing by online platforms now i'm surprised personally so i'm happy to say to, to do a tactical retreat and say okay for the time being, maybe the urgency isn't so isn't so immediate, because so far there is competition for the market. Whether there's going to be competition in the market, you know, the, the, your yeah. very seasoned microeconomist, I don't have to explain that to you. But whether there is sustainable competitive pressure, and and thus sustainable disciplining of for-profit agents to act reasonably well to uh, in, in terms of you know promoting public uh, social welfare social welfare that that remains to be seen i'm almost completely satisfied if if what i developed here gives us a quicker response when we start concluding ouch these platforms um they're not tolerable anymore right we don't want google music 
to make up 99% of the music distribution in the EU, if that ever would come to pass. And obviously that number is, you know, might never transpire and maybe we don't have that problem. As a, my understanding of, uh, of these, uh, these platforms and the microeconomics of them and the macroeconomic theory of them is that I'm quite pessimistic and that in the absence of another, you know, fundamental general purpose technology upsetting things very much, we might be happy at some point to have these kind of alternatives in our back pocket. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I get that. How do you, how, how do you can I, I mean, you don't have to reveal your own take on the matter, but uh, um, can you follow the argument and do you think there's something to it? I can, but it's all right. Please, um, the organizers, please let me know if I'm really abusing uh, the, the uh, monopolizing your time too much. But I'd, I'd love to engage in this discussion. So, actually, so the, the worry that you might have about um, a single platform being too strong, I can see, but um, only if it sort of harms consumers in the sense that. Um, you know, it um, uh, sort of this a big platform doesn't need to invest in innovation anymore, uh, and then uh, because of that, it you know we might not, and as consumers, you might not enjoy uh, you know uh, technologies that would have been or you know market developments, products, offerings, whatever that would have been uh, on the market in the absence of a of a dominant position. Yeah. And, in that in that sense, I'm not sure whether I follow your argument perfectly. Yeah, that, that's uh, because that, that's this is fine. much more a distribution issue rather than a rather than a, than an innovation issue. As long as you know, if we consider that you know, the the current way of distributing is the most efficient one, um, then I'm not sure where, sort of where would we get more innovation. Uh, but I have to think this through more carefully, I guess. Okay. Now, um, yeah, I'd, I'd be, I'd love to continue uh, this this uh, this discussion. This is really interesting. And um, yeah, the question is whether we. I mean, it seems like we, the two of us, seem to agree that there's something to being prepared, right? <laughs> if the market turns bad, to to know what the alternatives would be. Yeah. If, yeah. Uh, Maybe yes. Yeah. That that's the least I would. Um, I think we have accomplished. Um, and I would ex almost, you know, hope that virtually anybody um, um, would follow on that one, whether we are for the time being satisfied with the uh, online music subscription service that we witness, uh, wit that we witness and um, participate in. Um, yeah, that's. So for me, for me, it's really like this is this is a dream come true the way the way the world looks now, right? So this is imagine in two thousand. Uh, mm -hmm. And seeing how the world is, you have a you have a, a little device that you can literally carry anywhere that's connected to the internet, and you have access to almost every song ever produced for nine ninety nine. That's like for me. That's like the, how how can you even make it better for consumers? And so I have a hard time sort of understanding what's the counterfactual. So how how uh, you know how is well, what would be even better than that? It's not about all about consumers. I'm a cultural economist, so I always think about the creators. Ask the creators how they feel about it. They don't seem to be quite so happy. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. Yes. And things could always be better. Who knows that we wouldn't have had yeah. even more, even better music, even better audiovisual content, and so on, um, if we wouldn't have what I suggest are some problems with uh, centralized control and market power by for-profit organizations. Yeah. Yeah. This is really something. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a believer, right? This is not a religious quest. I think that this is not known, right? Yeah. We, we don't have the counterfactual. I don't think under these circumstances, we should be too complacent with the current situation. And I think we should tr continue to try to find out what the alternatives are and that we have at our disposal if things turn bad. One last, one last thing also with, uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I really enjoy this conversation. Thank you, Christian. Thank you all our participants. Um, one last thing, what I'm really worried about, and maybe I can get you around to be even more skeptical than, uh, than you were to start with, uh, skeptical about the operations of online platforms. Think about the transparency issues and the incentives. Who's really able to check whether the numbers reported by these platforms are actually legit um, and um, I would say there are big difficulties with that. And then once you do this, what are the incentives of these organizations? What would they do in order to maximize shareholder value? 
Yes, I'm totally, I'm totally with you. Okay, this. so, so the, in with this in transparency issue, we have a huge problem. And in all honesty, I'd want them to be heavily, heavily regulated in this respect, so that they become indistinguishable from collecting societies. Or I want collecting societies to take over simply because I want regulation that corresponds at least to what the recent directive of 2014 has uh, has introduced for the EU. I think that would be the starting point and it should include online music services because otherwise we have these incentive problems, intransparency problems, and then the clear incentives to exploit this intransparency to their advantage at the detriment, not only of users, but also of creators. I'm worried about this, but again, you know, prove- I'm with you on this. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad, to, um, I'm glad to hear that. So, yeah. And if you come up with a better alternative, I'm completely agnostic too. If we can solve the transparency issue otherwise, that's great. But sometimes you also just need an alternative to negotiate well <laughs> with private programs you want to re regulate. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, as an economist, you would say uh, competition heals everything. But just kidding. Yeah, but there's not, there's not <laughs> going to be systemic. Yeah, yeah, of course. There's not going to be that's, perfect that's, competition. That's, that's, yes, of course. Yeah. Of course. That was, I don't know whether I saw you pop up several times. Uh, that was one of the first things I presented today, that uh, the vision of a perfectly competitive market is of course, yeah. no, no, I'm, I'm in practical you. use yeah. uh, in applied economics regarding... Of course, of course. Yeah. So Great. my last question, if I may, um, which I think is the most interesting one. Um, oh. In your system, what happens um, to incentives to produce derivative works. And I'm back to uh, sort of thinking about consumer surplus here. Um, this basically liberalizes not only the copying, one-to-one -one copying, but it liberalizes also all kinds of um, remixes and cover versions and so on. Um, and basically takes away power from original rights owners to block that follow-on innovation, which I think has tremendous benefits for, for consumers. Um, and, and that is for me the, the most fascinating um, sort of implication of what you're suggesting. So, yeah. And you briefly talked about this in one or two sentences. I'd love to hear your, your yeah. part of that. I'm afraid I have to disappoint you here. Um, we checked, we included modification rights into the CCS. Yeah. Um, and of course, whether right holders would, would allow that encroachment on moral rights is very very questionable right attribution rights and modification rights are very sensitive um i think it's quite clear that if you get more money right if you have greater profits then you know that looks good you can compare scenarios but to actually say that you lose uh, the exclusive right to modify a work or for attribution i think that would be very there would be a very different kettle of fish we checked modification to include modification rights and they had no significant effect at all on willingness to pay for CCS and thus concluded that that should be out. So it's not going to be the solution. The way we, what we researched here is not going to be the solution for, for enabling derivative uh, works, mashups, you know, building more seamlessly on prior work without specific licensing uh, for follow-up works. This is, that's not what we did here. Absolutely, I completely agree that this is a big thing uh, we need to do. An obvious um, um, scenario, a hopeful scenario would be that micro contracting and uh, blockchain technology might enable this to some extent, but this is so preliminary. Uh, the short answer is we did not solve this here mm -hmm. and okay. look like it would solve it because there seems to be very few people who are willing to pay for the modification right. Maybe people didn't understand the value of it back in 2013. We, so yeah, absolutely. In, in the TikTok age, in the YouTube age, where people really enjoy all kinds of mashups, remixes, memes, and so on. So yeah, I, I agree. And then you would have, maybe this would be an interesting arena in which to try to create a system where it becomes clear that if you have a mashup of three popular songs, uh, how you divide that you create standards on how the that is split up right and it's not like with bittersweet symphony by the verve that all the money goes to the composer of the string arrangement right the yeah. 
right? So that you that you create better standards than than, than what the primitive solutions that seem to be around so far, and also costly solutions in terms of you know legal costs and so on to to get any kind of agreement uh, fixed. So there's some scope here. Thank you for that uh, for that uh, giving me that inspiration. Um, and uh, maybe we can think in that direction. I can think a bit more in that direction um, on how you could adopt this CCS to also better entail some improvements in this respect. But it's certainly a very important issue. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks everybody for organizing this. It's been very interesting. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the questions and the discussion. I'm afraid we won't have more time for questions, but if anyone has any questions and would like to ask them, uh, maybe they could send them, if that's okay, with you, Christian, to you by email or to me, and I will, will pass them on to you. Uh, uh, I think the discussion was very interesting. I was also considering this modification part, especially when it comes to TikTok, which isn't also very much researched yet. Um, but yeah. So thank you very much again, everyone. <laughs> and hopefully we'll see each other in the next uh, meetings as well. And the next one is actually about, <laughs> no worries, uh, about uh, YouTube advertising content differentiation. So perhaps something that might interest you as well. Um, and yeah, so thank you again. Thanks, everyone. I'm very glad that we got a discussion going after all. That was very, very educational for me as well. Thanks.